Welcome back, players. I'm Jack with 36 Cancel, and this is Coco the Wise Cat. So remember that little video I made earlier? Well, I'm here to deliver. This is the set preview for Overlord, or as it needs to be called in English due to copyright concerns, Tomb of Nazarick. Now, for those of you not in the know, the set is based on the light novels called Overlord and the anime that now has three seasons. In the not-so-distant future, a Japanese salaryman who has no friends, no family, and no joy in his outside life turns to an online virtual reality MMO called Yggdrasil. He's done it all, maxed his level in items, and become the strongest player leading the strongest guild in the game. But the game's going offline, and he spends the final night in his guild hall among the strong NPCs that guard the tomb of Nazarek, his guild's home. Momunga, the player, sits on his throne in the company of the NPCs, and after some quick edits, he waits for the game to count down to midnight and go offline. But then, Momunga finds that he's not only still in Yggdrasil, but all the NPCs have come to life. And what's more, what's outside the Tomb of Nazarek isn't Yggdrasil at all. In fact, it's a totally new and very real world. So Momunga, taking the mantle of his old guild, Ein Zulgon, sets off into this new world with his new companions to see just what this is all about. With Ayn's ridiculous power and the strength of his guardians, they could probably take over the world, but you'll have to get into Overlord to see just what happens. Now let's talk about how Overlord went from a 3D virtual reality to a full realistic world to the 2D cardboard that we know as Weishfors. Well, there's a lot to break down about this set. First of all, the set in Japan is definitely on the older side, meaning that while it lacks some of the more modern convenience and power, it has elements and cool stuff that you just don't see anymore that make it truly unique. It's a large set and utilizes all four colors pretty evenly, and dividing the colors into blue and yellow on one side and green and red on the other, the set draws a pretty hard line between two factions strictly enforced by character traits. In red and green, mostly carrying the heteromorphic race traits and the Nazarek traits, you have Ein Zulgon and most of his guardians, in yellow, there are some other guardians, but yellow is also where Ayn's secret identity, Momen the Adamantite Adventurer, and his partner in crime, Nabe, reside. And in blue, we have the denizens of the new world that Ayn's has found himself in. The searches, brainstorms, and trait links to each faction lock you out of combining the colors smoothly outside their natural pairings, with some exceptions. Now, a few other notes about the set. No matter how you build it, experience is a huge part of the theme. Many of the cards rely on having high-level cards in your level zone to get power or abilities, and Overlord has a lot of different events, a lot of which are versatile and powerful, and most of which represent super-tier magic that Ainz can cast or powerful artifacts in the world. One other thing to note about the set is that it only has two plusing level 1 combos, so monocolor builds outside those combos aren't really amazing. Though naturally, for all these rules, there are exceptions, and since so many of these are found in yellow, let's kick off with that color. Yellow carries some of the guardians which are also found in the other colors, like Demiurg and Sabus, but I think what they're going for flavor-wise is that these characters appear in yellow when they're acting in the capacity of the larger world, and not just Nazarek, like Sabus when he's building his relationship with Tare, and Demiurg when he's playing the villain Yaldabaoth. And following that theme, we have Momen and Nabe, the adventuring duo that are secretly Ainz and Narbel looking for more information about the world at large. And since they both carry the heteromorphic race and jet black traits, they can fit easily into either faction, which is why they have some of Overlord's stable cards. Let's dive right in with a level 1 combo that's most popular no matter how you're building Overlord, Momon, Hero Within a Hero. At base 4k, he gets plus 2k if you have experience 2 or greater, and he has a climax combo with a wind. If he reverses his opponent, he gets plus 2500 and plus 1 level until the end of your opponent's next turn, and then you top check, and if you find a human race or a heteromorphic race character, you add it to your hand. Now, pretty much every character in the set has one of these race traits, so he can grab anything no matter what style of deck you're playing, and he gets to 8500 on your opponent's turn. Scary. This moment is pretty much the go-to level 1 combo in the set, and it's easy to see why. But speaking of go-to stables, let's move to Nabe Beauty. At base 1500, if you have 2 or less stock, she gets plus 1500, and at the start of your opponent's draw phase, you reveal the top card. If it's a level 1 or higher, she bounces to hand. And with a set that puts emphasis on experience, she's got a pretty good shot at bouncing. A high power coin flip that quacks for yellow in a set that's so divided is sure to become a familiar face should you find yourself playing Overlord. Now, yellow also has some pretty good support cards. We have a level 0 Shao tier that climax switches, a 2-1 event that bounces two of your opponent's front row characters, a 103k event backup, an early play Nabe that top checks X where X is characters, and a 1-1 moment that gets huge in hand on core if he's in the center middle. But if you're feeling devilish, yellow does offer us a finishing combo. Let's talk about Demiurg. He has a 2-1 that comes in, lets you look at 2, and then add 1 and ditch 1. And when you play a shot climax, Genna, you can put him into your waiting room and put a level 3 Yaldabaoth on the stage from your hand for free. When he comes in from your hand, you mill the top and choose an X or lower character in your opponent's front row and send them to the waiting room, where X was the milled card's level. And on attack, with Genna in your climax zone, you can pay 1, salvage a character, and give Yaldabaoth cancel burn. Since this comes out at level 2 for basically free, this is a great way to apply early pressure and build hand advantage, and with the Shaltier Climax Switcher, it's viable to do this multiple turns in a row. 
The set also packs good backups and anti-front row tech so you can keep the beating down. All in all, it's an interesting and unique finishing choice. I think that's where we'll wrap up yellow though, because there's a lot more to cover. For now, I want to move to green and red, where Ainz and his guardians take a lion's share of the color wheel. And on just a whim, we'll start with red. Now red has a lot of cross-coloration in characters, but primarily it features Ainz, Albedo, Shoutir, and Ainz spellcasting events. It has no level 1 climax combo to offer us, but it does give us some guardian staples. Let's check them out. First up, we have Shaltir, Bloody Valkyrie. She bombs a character for 500 in the front on play, and she's a top self Salvage Brainstormer. It's the exact same profile as the Shuna Brainstormer from Slime, and many others like them, and it's a tried and true combo. Speaking of combos though, let's talk about Ein's strongest spellcaster. He's a level 0 that discard bonds for two strong red events that represent super tier magic. At base 2k, he's pretty flexible, so why don't we talk about the two events he bonds with. First up, we have the 1-0 event, Fallen Down. We all know it has a long casting time, but does some pretty good hurt. And the way it's designed in Weiss, Bushi's really managed to capture the spirit. You play it, and it goes to memory immediately. If you have a card in your memory already though, it can't be played. Each draw phase, you put the top card of your deck into your memory, face down. Then if you have four more face down cards in your memory, put all of them into your waiting room. If five or more cards were moved this way, deal two damage to your opponent. Long cast time, free damage. Not bad. But let's talk about Shooting Star, the 3-3 event that packs some real heat. It's got three modes, and you choose one. You can A, deal two damage to your opponent, B, heal two, or C, give one of your characters plus AK until the end of your opponent's next turn. So it's a super versatile event with discard bond. Not a bad inclusion at all. Okay, now that we've done some level zeros and events, let's talk about the other stuff Red offers. Particularly, Red offers us one standby climax to play and a 2-1 Eins that combos with it. Right of Resurrection Ainz gets minus one level in your hand if you have four more other heteromorphic race or Nazareth characters, and when you play Shaltier's Resurrection, the standby climax, if he's in your front row, you can stand one of your characters. So it's obvious what you're supposed to do with this. And the set packs a lot of powerful standby targets, a lot of big power 1-1s and 2-2s. Now for those of you rubbing your brain cells together, you'll notice that the early play on this dude requires a full board, which is pretty not cool when you're using the standby the same turn. Well, if you ever played standby before, you know that it's popular to include a bouncing character for that reason. That's why we have Essence of a Guardian, Albedo. Once she comes in, you can mill the top card and add X soul to a character where X was the soul trigger on the card milled. And when you play a Climax, you can bounce her to give 1k to a character. So she gives 1k1 potentially, which of course standby doesn't give, and she clears a board spot for a repeatable advantage. If you're playing the standby combo, you're probably playing her. So now that we've covered a lot of Red's tech, let's move on to level 3. First up, we have one of the set's best early plays, Albedo, Endless Loyalty. Four more early play, plus 500 for each other on your turn, and a discard stock heal. It's a standard and strong profile featuring best black-winged waifu. What more could we ask for? Well, how about a finisher? For that, look no further than Ein's Transcendental. When he comes in, top check 3, and during your turn he gets plus 500 for each other character, and for the finishing part, with a gate climax, you can pay 3, bounce him to hand, and pitch a card when he reverses his battle opponent. If you do, deck kick the battle opponent, and choose a card called Death Knight in your waiting room, and put that onto the stage in the same position that Ainz was in. So, a pseudo restander. But this one returns to your hand and deck kicks, which is way in above the call of duty for profiles like this. All in all, it's likely that this is one of the set's strongest finishers. But what's Death Knight? Well, it's actually a green level 1. It's a 1-0 5500 striker that gets plus 500 times X where X's characters on play or on change. And now that we've touched green, it's a great time to get into it as a whole. Now green is where we find Aura, Mare, and most of Demiurg's and Cocutus cards, and some of Albedo. It packs a ton of standby targets, including a 2-3 Cocutus that gets plus 1500 in hand encore when you have a 1-0 Demiurg on the stage, a 2-2 Cocutus that gives a free stock when it direct attacks, and several good 1-1 targets. If you're playing standby, you're playing green. But why else would you? Well, let's talk about another one of those famous level 0 staples that let you splash colors. Mare, Unreliable Messenger of Nature. Base 2k, he gets another plus 2k if you reveal a character with Nazarick or Heteromorphic Race when you play him off the top of your deck, and he's a mill runner for the same traits. A runner that can strike for 4k and stay mobile is pretty clutch, no doubt climbing over meaty characters and dodging techy ones. If you have green playables, you're probably running this Mare. Speaking of green playables... <sighs> I really wish this card was good. This Albedo probably has one of my favorite SPs in the game, and I really wanted to play her, but she's little more than a base 4500 that gets plus 15 on climax play and becomes a reverse search with a bar. Now that profile isn't terrible or unplayable by any means, but it's not amazing. In fact, with the flexibility of the Momo and level 1 combo and the stable zeros that Dale can offer, there's very little reason to play this if you're playing a deck with a level 1 combo. 
and besides Momon, it's pretty much Overlord's only level 1 advantage combo. It's painfully trial deck-esque nowadays, and unfortunately, it shows the set's age a bit. Albedo suffers the same fate with Infinite Sacrifice, a level 3 that heals, and when she direct attacks, you can pay 1 and pitch 1 to burn 1. Again, not terrible or unplayable, but not an amazing profile. But seriously, these SPs are beautiful, and regardless of their playability, I'll be looking for playsets, because after all, playing with cards isn't the only reason to own them, sometimes you just want to collect. Anyway, just three more things I want to touch on in green. There's an aura that, if she's in the front row, gives all characters plus 1500, which can be an insane power boost to standby decks similar to the Asha and Fantasia Bunko, and he's a pitch 2 character clock kick on either turn. Green also has a box topper promo that's a 2-1 pay 4 pitch 1 rest counter. Naturally, this is a high cost, but with the stock generation from certain cards in the set, and the deck not being stock heavy as it is, this is a great tempo inclusion and can straight up win you games. And finally, there's a 1-1 brainstorm backup event that only mills the top 2, but if you hit a climax, you can choose a character in battle, and that character deals no damage this turn. It's pretty much the same math as Compass, since it doesn't go back on top of your deck like Compass does if you miss. You dig one card less, but you also don't give yourself a free hit off the top. And with that, I'm going to cap off green. It has some other limited tech, but it's definitely not the most interesting color in the set. And that leaves blue, which is something totally different. Blue in Overlord is where everyone else is, the denizens of this new world that Ainz finds himself in. We've got all the members of Blue Rose, Princess Renner, Klaus, Brain, Climb, and some of the lizards. Oddly enough, we also have two level 3s of Momon and Gakutis, but we'll get to those later. Let's start at the bottom. There's the human side brainstormer, this Princess Renner, which is a tap self search for any blue or jet black character and a plus 500 front center buff. Very strong and a very standard inclusion for any run running humans in Overlord. And also at level 0, we have a Blue Rose Tia, who buffs a character by 500 on attack, and is also a bottom decker. Again, not a bad inclusion. Now, if we move to level 1, we notice that Blue has no climax combos of its own. So you're probably playing the moment since you can grab anything with a Jet Black trait, which most Blue characters have anyway. But Blue does have some good level 1 tech of its own. There's a level 1 Lycus that's a base 4k and gets 500 for each other, and then is a top check 3 on death. Very similar to the Kirito level one that everyone plays in SAO. We all know why that's good, so let's move on. Now, I just wanted to move along to talk about this event, Adam and Tyne Adventurer. It's a 2-1 backup event that if you have four more jet black or blue characters, you can choose a blue rose character in your clock and return it to hand. Then you send this to memory. This is pretty much a more specific Psyg as Wish that doesn't send the defending character to memory. But still, this is mad good. A bit situational, but still good. We've got some great blue rose staples in blue, obviously, so finding a target shouldn't be a problem. And speaking of targets, let's talk about Humanity's Finisher. Blue Rose Evil Eye is a level 3 healer with a Pants Climax combo. When you place the Climax and she's in your front row, you can perform one of the two effects. Either you can choose 3 cards in your opponent's waiting room and shuffle them back into their deck, or you can pitch 2 cards and deal X damage where X is Climaxes in your opponent's waiting room. All of this happens when you play the Climax, and the effects are very flexible depending on the endgame situation you find yourself in. Definitely a good finisher that heals on top of a nice combo. It's worth mentioning that if you find your opponent in a situation where they have a tiny deck with one or no climaxes in it, and you manage to get three of these on the board, it's pretty much game over as you can just put nine free damage back into a deck that has little to no chance of cancelling, so be very careful not to let yourself get got by Evil Eye. On the flip side, if your opponent has little to no cards in their waiting room, she's basically just a healer, so plan accordingly. Now that's the only finisher with a human race trait, but that doesn't mean we're done with blue. Oh no, we've still got that Momon and Kikutis. Momon, a new legend, is a 3-2 that when his battle opponent becomes reversed on your turn, you can pay one and choose one of your opponent's characters, and that character doesn't stand during the next stand phase. And his other ability? Well, once per turn, at the end of his attack, you can rest one of your standing characters. If you do, your opponent brainstorms three from the bottom of their deck, and if there is no climax revealed this way, you get to stand him. Now, if you're playing blue in any capacity, throwing this guy as a 1 or 2 of is a prime tech choice. But if you're playing a more blue focus and you want a more high power finisher, Kakutis would like to have a word with you. Proud Warrior Kakutis, if you have 4 more experience, gets plus 1k for each of your opponent's rested characters, and when he comes in, you salvage. His climax is a book, and when he attacks, you can pay 2 and pitch 1. If you do, straight up deal 5 damage to your opponent. Now, Kakutis being in blue makes him a tough splash, especially with the blue climax and him disagreeing with most of the traits that blue works well with, but keep in mind we still have the moment level 1 which can grab him, and the Renner Brainstormer that gets any blue character. So if you want a hard-hitting, no-bullshit finisher, Kakutis is definitely an option. And this is where I'll wrap up blue, and thus the entire color wheel. Sure, the set has other neat tricks, but I can't mention everything. So let's talk about how these cards shape up into a deck. Overlord is an interesting set, but when it comes to constructing decks, you're basically asking yourself, Am I playing standby or not? 
If you are, it's unlikely that you'll play another combo besides a finisher, and standby's best targets are in red and green, so most standby decks take the shell of red and green with the early play Ions and green targets using the Ions and Death Knight finisher. Not much room to play with it, unfortunately. But if you're not playing standby, guess what? You're playing yellow for Momon. Lucky for you, yellow is so splashable and the combo is so flexible that you can play just about anything on top of him. You can put together a blue and yellow bill with either Evil Eye or Cocutus as your finishers, or you can go the more traditional route and make a red and yellow or even Tricolor Sans Blue Nazarek build. But no matter how you decide to build, the staples fall into place pretty easily and you're basically filling in the blanks with stylistic choices. Look, let's be honest with ourselves. Is Overlord a super meta set with all sorts of choices to build out game-defining decks? No. But is that any reason to pass over it? Absolutely not. After all, there are more important things than playing a stupid busted meta deck, like SPL Betos for example, that I'll be playing in my future red and green deck. But to see what I've got planned for Overlord when it comes out, you'll just have to stay tuned. I'm excited for this one players. Look forward to more Nazareth content in the near future. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.